Hello, everybody, and welcome to this joint Align and Investing in Women webinar on can social media reshape gender norms around women's economic rights. My name is Atif, and I'm a researcher in the Gender Equality and Social Inclusion team at ODI, which hosts the Align platform, your go-to place for all things gender norms. And we're delighted to be co-hosting this webinar today with Investing in Women, which is an Australian government-funded initiative that's committed to promoting women's economic empowerment across Southeast Asia. So between 2020 and 2022, Investing in Women supported social media campaigns in Indonesia, the Philippines, and Vietnam, challenging four key norms identified as impeding women's economic advancement. The first norm was caregiving. So this was the idea that a woman's primary role is in the home, caring for children, and family members. The second norm was sort of the opposite of that one, the breadwinning norm. So this is the idea that a man's role is to be the primary income earner of the family. The third norm was on job segregation, that women and men have distinct skills applicable for specific and often different types of work. And the last norm was on leadership. So this idea that men are better suited to be leaders and women are better suited for more supportive roles. So caregiving, breadwinning, job segregation, and leadership. So the purpose of today's webinar really is to learn more about, you know, this really quite novel research that was conducted on this topic, digging into two main areas. The one on, you know, shifting norms around women's economic empowerment, what might work in that regard. But then on the other hand, also looking at the use of social media specifically as a tool for norm change. So to discuss all of this today, I'm really happy to introduce our guests. We have three panelists, one from each of the countries of study. Um, starting in Indonesia, we have Dr. Wijayanto or Wija. Uh, Wija is the director of the Center for Media and Democracy at the Institute for Economic and Social Research, Education and Information. And he's also an assistant professor at the Government Science Study Program at Dipo Negoro University. Welcome, Wija. Next, in the Philippines, we have Shine Rapanot. Shine is an instructor at the Department of Communication Research at the University of the Philippines. And third, in Vietnam, we have Diem Trang Vo, or Trang. And Trang is an associate lecturer in communication at RMIT University, Vietnam. So those are our three panelists. And then we also have Zamina Nasir joining us today. Zermina is Director for Influencing Gender Norms at Investing in Women, and she'll be providing a summary at the end of the webinar, as well as some closing remarks. So next, just on a, a little bit of housekeeping points. So first of all, I think you should have got a notification that this webinar is being recorded. I hope that's okay with everybody. Um, and we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear your thoughts, your questions, and your comments. So please do send them over to us. I think at the bottom of the Zoom window, you'll see a Q&A button. If you push that, it'll open up the box. And just please do feel free to send, send questions through to us as and when they come. And we'll do our best to go through as many as we can, um, time permitting. Um, and finally, just before we dive into it, I think it would be nice to just get a hear from all of you, really, and get a quick feel of the room. So we're going to have a quick poll. The question is, do you think social media can influence gender norm change? So over to you. We'll give you a few moments just to, to cast your vote. Okay, maybe we can close the poll and see if we can get a result. Wow, that's pretty convincing. So 92% have said yes, um, and 8% are unsure. So pretty comprehensive. Um, I won't give any spoilers away right now, but um, hopefully we can dig in a bit deeper on this and pull out some of the nuance, um, especially on this topic. So with that, over to the panelists. I think it would be lovely. I I'll go in the same order that I introduced you all. So starting with Ouija and then Shine and then Trang. Um, but Ouija, starting with you, you know, in, 
about three minutes or so. Can you give us, you know, just talk us through the campaigns, please, if you can, and then follow that up with the research approach and the key findings. Over to you, Rija. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Adif. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, is my voice audible? Great. Um, so, uh, first of all, before answering the question, I would like to address that this is a collaborative work involving other researchers who are also present here, I guess. Um, I want to share the same credit to Ratna Hanani, uh, Nurul Hasfi, uh, my colleagues from the Bonagora University, Gita El Sita, Lia Angraini from LBDAS, Ismail Fahmi and Zalnova from Drone and Brit. Now uh, to uh, active questions. So I would like to share three kinds of news, basically. Good news, not so good news, and maybe even better news. I will start with the uh, first one, hopefully in three minutes. So uh, what we found uh, from our research in Indonesia is that social media campaign can be effective in raising awareness and changing attitudes around gender norms, particularly among younger audience in Indonesia. So uh, how do we know about it? Uh, we got uh, a lot of reactions to the four affirmations uh, um, norms that uh, are different mentioned. So from uh, the 1st of April 2020 to 21st May 2022, uh, there were uh, 1,300 uh, something posts and the reaction is 1.5 million. So you can imagine, so a huge response and, and reactions. And mostly the sentiments uh, is positive. Um, some of them, uh, some, of, some of the posts, uh, around almost 30,000 in the form of replies. So replies mean there, are, there were in the discussions. Uh, and some of them uh, brought uh, offline by the audiences. So, then after seeing the post, they share it to and discuss among their peers. Uh, social media campaigns get uh, translated into offline activities, such as discussion in communities or participation in, um, uh, in, in, in a discussion, yeah. Um, and there are some not so good news as well. So, you know, as I mentioned before, now, there were uh, uh, around 30,000 replies or, or comments, but most of the engagement narration is silent, like, you know, you know, such as like, views, and share. And most, the, most of the audience is still female and uh, live in big cities in Java. Uh, and some, uh, some of the campaigners, some of the uh, IW partner got a private message uh, backlash. Uh, not, not so many. And now I guess the even better news. So, you know, uh, our institution, um, uh, Institute, Institute of uh, Social Economic uh, Research, um, Education and Information, LPTIS, uh, is partly inspired by this project. We, since last year, we found a new uh, center, Center for Gender and Social Inclusion. So, this is, I guess, manifested in, in institution. Uh, I was, uh, I happen to be one of the founders, even though I'm not the director of this new uh, center. So that will be to uh, uh, two minutes for for your questions, Atif. That's wonderful. Thank you, Vijay. So really, I think good news. A lot of posts, a lot of reach, mostly positive. The not so good, slightly fewer engagements in terms of comments. A bit more passive engagement and potentially backlash. And the even better news is there's a new center that's gonna be working hopefully on this. That's wonderful. Thanks so much. Um, can I now pass on to Shine? Uh, same question to you, please, Shine. Yeah, thanks, Atif. Uh, it was great to hear uh, from Dr. Rija. I'm Shine, representing the team from the Philippines. And I would also like to acknowledge my team, Dr. Ernan Paragas, Fatim Magao, Ben Bunkin, and Summer Agonos. So I am one of five people who worked on this. And we studied three campaigns from the Philippines, from three different organizations, uh, dealing with three like different aspects of the norms. Okay, So one advocated for sharing housework and childcare, one focused on encouraging women to engage in male-dominated uh, technical vocational um, areas of work and study, and one worked towards empowering women startup owners in the realm of tech and business. And 
that said, these campaigns targeted varying audience, audience segments and from spouses to parents, to students, to business owners, um, across scales, okay? And they also employed varying social media communication strategies like releasing paid ads, uh, holding virtual events, creating Facebook groups, and uploading series of information campaigns. So our team social media research has two complementary components. Uh, first is the social media listening component, which employed a three-pronged approach composed of a landscape analysis, a network analysis, and a discourse analysis. So this went from within the campaigns to beyond the campaigns. And second part would be the reception analysis designed to unearth insights from the audience's side of the campaign. And the main takeaway from our study, which I think we can take off from uh, later, is interestingly how economic realities, among other factors, of course, but mainly how economic realities shape people's lived experiences of gender, the circumstances under which people live, under which people work, um, they are they influence how people act in relation to gender norms and drawing from that insight the understanding of how complexly interrelated economic circumstances and gender norms are uh, we can see that it's safe to say that shifts in how we understand the norms can also bring about changes in the economic circumstance as well and in the case of this webinar, we are talking about women's economic rights, and we will need a platform for that. That's why we're talking about social media, and it's become a widely used tool for precisely that, forwarding advocacies, releasing campaigns, and all that. But from our research findings, uh, similar to Indonesia, interestingly, social media looks like an effective and promising tool for campaigning in terms of disseminating information and providing uh, spaces to start and maintain necessary conversations. However, the challenge lies in how online campaigns translate to offline interventions and offline discourses, and how both online and offline efforts actually bring forth changes in culture and policy at the levels of both institutions and communities. And that would be all for now for me, Atif. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Shine. I think uh, it's great to hear so, so many you know, different diverse methods that were used in the research in the Philippines. Um, I just want to sort of echo what you said again on how the economic realities shape our lived experiences. And this question that you pose at the end, which is, you know, social media as an information sharing tool and maybe as like a conversation starter, but then how do we go beyond that to actually get to norm change, which is what we're trying to achieve, right? Um, so thanks once again, Shine. Uh, Trang, over to you. Again, same question, please. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the great findings from Indonesia and Philippines. So now I would share the perspective from uh, our research team in Vietnam. So on behalf of my research team, um, we acknowledge that social media is a great place for expanding and diversifying our understanding of gender norms, especially through campaigns that target different demographics. So in our research, we look at six campaigns that are supported by investing in women and uh, similar to like our friends here, these campaigns like target different groups of people. Some of the campaigns just target um, normal publics. Some campaigns will um, target more on the people from the pop culture or the movie makers. Some campaigns look at like women and philosophy or gender and philosophy look into the history of gender. And our research was conducted in the first half of 2022 through first, we conducted the textual analysis. We looked through about 12,000 posts on social media in general, in order to see that how currently Facebook in Vietnam talk about gender norms or gender norms. And we found that, sadly, Facebook pages are currently amplified traditional gender norms that are already available in the offline space. For example, general entertainment Facebook pages still talk about women roles in caring for children, women's beauty as a skill at work, or women's beauty as a must to maintain their family. These reflect the social pressures embedded in the society. And then we look into the six campaigns that are supported by investing women. And we see that um, these campaigns have arise many different kinds of discussions. So one part of the discussions at first are kind of, kind of negative because they can bring unnecessary debates and personal attacks. They are the one we call resistant. 
of the modern gender norms because they believe that those who support the gender equality are being selfish, are ungrateful to the society, are westernized, and they cannot maintain the Vietnamese value or culture anymore. But however, due to the, these campaign on social media, the six campaigns that we are investigated in, we see that the supporters of gender equality have an ability to exercise a range of agency as well. So for example, at an individual level, the supporters now can gather together and they do not really create any counteracting negative comments as they think doing so would only derail the core messages they send. Alternatively, the supporters use content about the positive impact of equality in everyday life in order to persuade these resistance that no gender equality does not mean like what you are thinking and we could have the more positive practice of gender equality. And at a campaign level, at an organizational level, such as campaigns supported by IW, personal stories, materials from pop cultures, and discussions about current events, or discussions about news affairs that could tie back to the uh, gender practices are the content used for campaigning. And through these um, tactics for the campaigns, they could spread more um, messages about how can we tackle to gender norms through everyday life, through pop cultures, or even through some kinds of practices. Okay, And that is uh, one of our findings. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Trang. So I think what you mentioned there is so interesting that on the one hand, you have this macro view, right, of analyzing the whole sort of social media scene, let's say, and you find that there's traditional gender norms that are really being amplified um, by things like Facebook. And then it goes into those intentional campaigns um, to understand how supporters can come together, can share positive messages and all the different ways that this can be done. So that's brilliant. Thanks so much. I think... Um, you know, what I'd like to do now actually is um, just ask a few questions to start us off before opening up to the wider audience. But please do keep your questions coming in using the Q&A button and we will get to them uh, very shortly. Um, the first question I have is really uh, about the norms themselves. So these four norms that we heard of caregiver, breadwinner, job segregation. And this question is to Shine. Um, mm -hmm. Shine, among the four norms, were there some norms that maybe were more difficult to, to talk about or that were somehow sort of less salient, let's say, in mm -hmm. conversations compared to the others? And if so, why do you think this might have been the case? Yeah, uh, to start with, I think the, the most talked about norm in the Philippines is actually child rearing and, and housekeeping. So the first one. Uh, but in terms of less salient, well, first, the context of leadership uh, in the Philippines study, I think we should also disclose this, you know, uh, we did the, the research during campaign season. It was election season in the Philippines. And the context was there was there were 10 presidential candidates, one woman. So leadership in, in our study kind of had that slash politics aspect of it. Um, but since we're talking about economic rights here, what I would want to take off from here is how we found that these courses surrounding job segregation weren't as directly about job segregation per se. It's less of jobs being more for women or more for men and more of what jobs can accommodate women or can accommodate you know, women's needs, say if they are single mothers or breastfeeding mothers or not mothers, but with familial responsibilities. Uh, I think the discourse is leaned more towards that. So not necessarily segregation, but it's an overlap with, with breadwinning, you know, if, if, you, if you get what I mean. So I, I will start from there and I will be very interested to hear with our other colleagues here if such was the case when it came to job segregation also in um, Indonesia and uh, Vietnam. Thanks, Shine. Okay, so mostly on the care side, uh, and domestic work, it seems, some on leadership, but perhaps more focused on political leadership rather than leadership in, in businesses as such. Yeah. Um, but I think it's also interesting how you talk about how external events can then completely influence, obviously, what, what everyone's thinking and, and doing, right? Um, fantastic. So next question I have is for uh, Trang, actually, on, on the platform itself. So Trang, how do you see 
how do you see social media specifically working as a tool for positive change in relation to gender roles? Yeah, so um, our research shows that like dealing with resistance and the mitigation strategies have been applied at both individual and organizational levels. So social media can act as a channel to gather like-minded people. And it is considered as like powerful when participants can learn from each other and gain motivation to raise their voices. For example, in one of my interview, there's the participants say that the campaign provided them with more confidence and new networks. So when they go offline and they face any criticism, they know that somewhere on online, there some people can support their views of gender equality. And now they are more motivated to go to the campaign, discuss with the people who are the supporters, strengthen their beliefs, and they go offline to argue or to discuss more with the resistance. And here, social media is the place to gather like-minded people. And social media can also act as a two-way communication tool. When the campaigners don't just distribute the content themselves. But some the content creators, they share with me that sometimes the participants inbox them and say and tell them that, hey, I think that there is the new events here. Maybe we should create the content in this event or it, about this movie. So it can discuss more about how we can talk about gender equality in the broader view. Or social media could also act as the updates of status of gender equality in the country. So some interviewees tell me that through these campaigns, they feel more optimism about the current social trajectory. So they know that currently Vietnam starts to have more conversations about gender equality and lots of conversations are now accepted. So they have like more strength and more motivation to like uh, support these ideas offline and online as well. Fantastic. So basically what we're saying is, you know, People can have more confidence from using the social media. They can find new networks, like-minded people. I like this point about it being a two-way communication tool as well. Um, and kind of just getting a finger on the pulse is, you know, maybe there's an optimism that things are shifting, things are changing, and there are other people who feel the same way as, as, as they do. Um, Weija, can I build on that question really and ask you um, in the Indonesia example, um, how did you find that the online campaigns then translated into offline activities? <clears throat> uh, thank you, Ati, for a wonderful question. Um, so that's, that's, I guess, um, the one of the $1 million questions for a scholar like, uh, like me. Uh, how the, the relation between the online campaign and the offline activity or online activism and offline activism. So um and that's um i will i will go there but um something i missed in, in your first question i would like to address five uh, civil society uh, organization or iw partners in indonesia that we we did research to their campaigns uh, they are magdalene yeah, sanpuli rumah kitab and muslimah pekerja plan international and idcom so now i will go there uh, in indonesia we combine three different kind of uh, research method the first is big data analysis. So this is quantitative part uh, in which we gather millions of data. And second is digital ethnography in which we examine uh, the day-to-day -day we observe uh, the interaction within the social media platform. And the third is in-depth interview. So with this kind of three kind of methods, uh, we are able to answer how it's transformed into offline activity. Uh, especially uh, during the focus group discussion, uh, who is led by uh, uh, our colleague uh, Hannah, uh, that uh, so uh, from the interview we found that um, those audience who are inspired by the posting uh, in the in the social media platform, they then internal internalize it and then they share it to their friends or uh, close friends uh, whom they believe uh, they can trust, uh, which means that uh, this is the circle that will not oppose what they will uh, argue or they will share. So just to give you one, uh, one example of uh, a quote yeah, from, of interview, uh, there's a, a female respondent, a female informant who, who said that 
Uh, I used to think about women roles in terms of quadrat, gender division based on divine order that cannot be changed. I used to think that as woman and housewife, you don't have to talk a lot, have opinions and for your husband words. Now my way of thinking is different and I am choosing my new life with a full awareness. So that's, that's the example of how the campaign transformed her. Uh, uh, but uh, how, um, and there's another interview uh, in which uh, demonstrate that uh, what, uh, what has transformed her or enlightened her, uh, then she started to share it. I am starting to introduce gender equality, said her to the children, because I am also a teacher at the kindergarten. I started with easy practices such as introducing that all colors are beautiful, that it's okay for boys to cry when they get hurt. So, you know, the audiences that become the target for sharing is the children, the, the you know, the people that they believe they will not uh, react or they will not be angry with their idea of equality. And also they shared it to a uh, younger generation and mostly continue with life's discussion. However, there are some notes as well, you know, when they try to discuss gender issues with their own family, and this is the quotes, but when I try to discuss gender issue with my own family, it is always lead to debate and my sister and my mother will usually, uh, and with the word halah, halah means, you know, just ignore it, meaning end of discussion, or they, they ask me to stop the conversation. If I discuss with old men like my father or my uncle, they will suddenly deny it and object it straight away. So uh, you can see that uh, it's turned from into a live discussion uh, to younger generation, to inner circle that whom they believe, they trust, however, not to everyone. So uh, usually they are very selective. That will be the, uh, the story that I can share, Antif. Brilliant. Thanks, Rija. So really, it, <clears throat> from the sounds of it, it's using their focus group discussions, using those in-depth interviews to understand how what people have done after engaging with the content. And really, yeah. as you say, it's about internalizing it and then maybe sharing it um, with friends or with family. Sometimes it works and it, and it sort of continues. Sometimes it doesn't. But testing yeah. that that boundaries and trying to change is um, is really what came through there for me. Thanks for that. I think we have time for one more question from me before it's then over to the audience. Um, this question I'd like to ask to Shine, um, and this is really about the people. So I'd love yeah. to know a bit more about sort of the target demographics um, of some of the campaigns in the Philippines, and especially this one, I think reading through the brief, um, that reached over 30 million people. Yeah. Um, so can you talk us through that? And then, you know, perhaps a follow-up question there is, does this suggest that social media campaigns are sort of the best value for money when it comes to um, targeting many people at scale? Yeah, thanks. Uh, as I've mentioned in my introductory spiel, since the campaigns in the Philippines focused on different aspects of the norms, they also had different target audiences. So one would be towards... Uh, people with parenting responsibilities or people who are spouses, some would, um, the technical vocational advocacy would go to a younger demographic. But I think one thing we can um, note from here is how first, the, the campaigns in the Philippines largely still involve women. And this is a, a huge opportunity to involve men as well. So uh, in, in campaigning for women's rights, for gender equality, um, let's try to, you know, expand our, our audiences. And I think uh, one of the organizations in the Philippines has this really interesting um, campaign where it's called Flex Your Husband or Flex Your House Husband, uh, where wives would have this group and they could share that, oh, my husband also does this. Um, but we can take that, I think, uh, we can take that a step further by involving the husbands directly in the group, you know, apart from just having their wives talk about them. And I would like to uh, build up on what you said earlier from the insight uh, from Indonesia as well, where you will have a target demographic on social media, like you will be focused on this. But if it's an online event, for example, one case that we have during an interview with a young person, I think this was a, um, a girl in her late teens to early 20s. 
she brought both her parents to the online event. Like it was a webinar and she was like, mom, dad, sit with me <laughs> and listen up. Okay. And the dad and the mom had different reactions to the event, but it, it was, you know, a way to transform uh, what was being talked about online to a conversation offline. And it was a family um, affair for them. Now on to your next question about reach. Um, the 30 million, really big number, right? Um, the 30 million, just to, to clarify, that is not unique, but still um, it's 31 million. Um, and it's a lot. When we take reach at surface value, it's really sparkly. But um, one thing I think I want to raise here is the importance of having clearer conversion points because reach would just you know tell us about how many people saw this, how many people attended, or how many people um, were exposed to the material. But since we're talking change here, perhaps what we can do better at would be measuring, having clearer measures for that change that we want to see. If we're measuring behavior change, then we would want an evaluation. If we want attitude change, we would want to ask that after the event, what do you think about what you've learned? So um, from here, you know, we would want to have a measurable change. Um, and if we really want to correlate it, if it's like the campaign actually that brought about the change in the person, then we would have, I'm speaking from an operational like level here, we would need a steady framework and research instrument or evaluation instrument that can actually do that for us. So reach is good, reach is an initial insight that we can look at, but if we're really measuring change here or how change happens, then there needs to be a bit more questions and a bit more surveying that needs to be involved. That would be all I think. Thank you, Shine. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think that came out in a lot of the research is that it's mostly women who are engaging with a lot of the content. So let's expand this to men. Let's involve them directly. Let's get parents involved, those with maybe more traditional uh, gender, gender views, let's say, and norms. Um, and then let's think about going on metrics beyond reach. So um, how, how does it translate into change? Um, brilliant. Okay, so I think over to you, our audience now, we'll, we'll, there's already plenty of questions coming in. Uh, we'll try and get through as many as possible in the next 20 minutes or so. Uh, I will just have a quick check. I think one interesting one, if I combine perhaps two, and I'd like to pose this to Trang. Um, one is on sort of specific male engagement slash positive masculinities. Um, was there some sort of male engagement strategy um, to shift gender norms? And the second point of that one is on backlash. So what should social media users do to handle backlash and negative comments? Wow, this is a very big <laughs> question. So I will start with the male engagement part. So um, through the interview with the male participants, we find like some different strategies that could engage men in a positive way because we feel that currently in the gender equality discussions, most discussions are just about women. So one part is to create different men related contents. For example, contents such as toxic masculinity, soft masculinity attracts lots of attention and interaction of male participants. So when men, men read those contents, they could think again, change their attitudes about gender equality because one part of the negative comments or negative perceptions of gender equality is the men think that gender equality is now affect them, harm their own social status. So in this way, we can uh, show that gender equality benefits both genders, not just women and harm the men. So the second strategy is to create some activities such as uh, some mini games or contests. So there is one successful activity from an IW campaign that has asked everyone to observe how their household has changed during the COVID-19. So, so some men shares that they used to ask their mom, their sister to clean their room because they were too busy and they didn't see it as a problem because they are too busy. Um, but when they start to stay at home and because they joined the, the competition, now they start to experience that those tasks are, are a lot to keep the house clean so that they see more responsibilities to join that. And in that vein, 
supporters of gender equality frame messages related to their everyday stories and to ensure that these stories are related to the wider audiences. And there are some kind of neutral workshops or events such as gender and philosophy or the history of gender. So men are those like uh, in Vietnam, they really like the topic like philosophy, history, and things like that. So uh, when they join those workshops, they start to understand the meaning of gender, the, the philosophy behind gender, and how men and women could share opinions through those things. So those are some, some kind of uh, strategies to engage men. But from the researchers' view, we acknowledge that much efforts should be spent to promote the gender equality for men and to engage men in this conversation. And what is the second question? Ajit? The second one was on, on backlash. And I remember, you know, you mentioned how people were branded selfish, uh, for instance, Ajit. right? So how, how do you deal with that? Um, and are there some strategies to overcome that? Yeah, so uh, let me summarize the kind of backlash. So this resistance, uh, typically came from three types of people. First, the men who view that gender equality would harm their social status and advantage. Second, they are economically privileged women who did not interpret themselves as affected by the gender norms. Uh, three are the supporters of the established norms and practice who were often a part of the older generation, like our parents, our grandparents. And these people criticize the idea of gender equality because they think that the supporters are selfish because they only think about themselves, while Vietnam is the country that supports collectivism culture. And they think that these supporters are westernized and rebellious. Now they are just trying to mimic all the cultures and this harm to the national identity as well. And in the family, supporters of gender equality are viewed as ungrateful to parents because people often have the misconceptions that supporting gender equality means refusing to get married and give birth, and that would contribute to ending the family bloodline. So that um, all of these uh, negative ideas about gender equality has been uh, dealt by different tactics. So at the individual levels, people try not to create like big arguments about this, but they try to create more positive messages about how the misconceptions of gender equality exist and how we can change our understanding about that. And at the organization levels, so the campaign admins could stimulate more personal experience sharing to create constructive discussions about that. So again, for example, we have mini games, we have competitions that ask every individual to share their stories and it would be related to a wider public. And another way is they try to stimulate the discussions related to new perspectives. For example, the campaigns question the role of women in washing dishes, or they question the current uniform design in some high schools, which is like being normalized for a very long time, but now they print that up and they start to question that, challenge that to get more discussion. Or they discuss about the toxic masculinity in the um, in our like entertainment industry and why we have the questions on what the male singer should wear. So in those ways, we can um, show the real examples of the ramifications of traditional gender norms and we can understand the conflicts of their current norms and also promote the more positive messages. Right, thanks, that's super detailed. That's really nice to hear that. Thank you, Trang. Um, we have another question here. I think I will pose this to Shine. This question says, is there any insight into engagement of people abroad or living in other countries, especially the diaspora? Um, do people living abroad engage with these campaigns? If so, how do they contribute to shifting gender norms back home? Interesting. Uh, I have to be honest. Uh, I don't think we had insights regarding diasporic Filipinos because the audiences that we were able to, to do interviews and group discussions with were all based here. But um, maybe um, our fellow panel members can help me out with this. Although, it, given that we're talking about social media, I think it's not far and it's not you know impossible that the campaigns would have reached people 
in the diaspora as to how they change the discourse though that I cannot speak just yet. Thanks. Luigi, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that, otherwise I can move to the next question. Um, sorry, what was the question again? Uh, this question was really about um, people living abroad or the diaspora engaging with the content. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so met met methodologically, we cannot uh, identify whether, you know, those who participate in um, in the conversation is a diaspora or from abroad, uh, mm -hmm. we cannot put out that because we found that mostly live in Indonesian big cities in Indonesia, diaspora means someone live abroad, right? But I agree to the point that living abroad uh, give insights to the more equality in terms of uh, uh, relation, gender relationship between men and men, men and women, because I, I personally experienced myself uh, lived in the Netherlands for like um, almost seven years. Um, and so um, not just uh, the culture influenced me, but, you know, to live abroad with, for instance, my wife, and there were just the two of us. So we we, we are used, used to with uh, sharing the role uh, for taking care of the baby or everything, you know, e equally. So that would be, I guess that's also influencing. So but uh, but also it depends on which kind of country that you lived in. If I lived in you know other country that has a patriarchal culture, maybe the, the the influence is different. Okay, fantastic. Thanks. I'm gonna ask you, Vijay, the next question. Uh, it's a really interesting one. Are there any legal restrictions on social media in the countries that limited the content of the campaigns and how radical or transformative the messaging was? So for example, did any of the campaign authors limit the messaging about gender equality because of fear of persecution or formal limitations on content on social media? Uh, okay, so the short answer for that is no. Um, um, in my view, this is because um, usually the depression is for the content that directly criticized the government, if there is any, you know, uh, the power holders. But uh, in this kind of um, uh, of message uh, for gender equality, um, um, uh, so far as far as I know, there is no such a thing. However, maybe the source of you know the source of the anxiety or fear is not the legal restric restriction itself but more uh, from the persecution from the society. So, uh, so in relation to the answer from Trang, I guess for, for, for the questions, uh, how, do, how did we react to backlash? Uh, so the uh, IW partner in Indonesia, usually uh, the, the, the tricks that they use are you know, uh, wisely selecting the social media platform. You know, uh, they are, for instance, more in favor to use uh, Instagram rather than Twitter, you know, because in Indonesia, the character of Twitter uh, is very, very uh, open, and there are a lot of uh, cyber troopers, a lot of fake accounts there, anonymous accounts there, and usually the, the discussion going on on the Twitter is more hostile than for instance in Instagram. So uh, the strategy is in terms of um, uh, social media platform uh, to create conversation, they use uh, Instagram. And our uh, research found that Instagram indeed uh, created more conversation rather than any other platforms, more than any other platforms. And the second thing is uh, the, the campaign, they usually use more positive messages. So not so provocative one. Uh, so that's also another strategy. Uh, part of the reason to use that kind of uh, strategy is because, I guess, uh, in the back of the minds, there are some people, if we are too critical, then there will be reactions, right? Um, and lastly, now, when the backlash happened, uh, they, the, 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 the civil society, the, the partners, they, uh, they use calm words, they use uh, positive words, and um, you know, while the strategy is uh, is um, moderation or or more compromising, but the value or the evidence is uh, conveyed strongly. So uh, I guess uh, that would be 
uh, that that reflects that actually uh, deep inside uh, deep inside we know that there are still people who embrace the old values and we don't want to uh, to uh, create uh, you know quarreling or even fight or wars uh, on the on the internet because that's uh, that's after all that's not uh, a, 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 the best way to persuade people to embrace the new norms. Brilliant. I find it. I think it's so interesting how you spoke about the sort of uh, different strategies, but also different responses that you got from different social media platforms. And that was a question that actually came in too. So you've already answered that one for us. Thanks, Regina. Um, there's one really interesting question here. Uh, perhaps I'll pose this to Trang, but Shine, if you have any thoughts, come in as well, please. So on reach and engagement. So how do you balance a trade-off between breadth and depth? Any evaluative instrument you've come across that respond to both a balance of breadth and depth measures? Okay, so that is about the measurement of the campaign. So basically for the, um, the campaigners that I talked to, not many of them stress about the, the reach and the views and the like quantitative metrics on social media because for them, their mission is more like empower people so that they can have more confidence, more networks to deal with different issues online and offline. So for our cases, they uh, focus more on the, the, the depth of the campaign, on how much um, people can question, they can criticize about the, the new ideas or how can they think it is related to their own um, everyday works. So it, it when, when I talk with them, they think about how to talk about gender equality in different perspective of life, like in movies, in music, in lyrics, in news affairs, like or in um, different materials of education, rather than being pressured by lies or comments or number of shares. Brilliant, thanks. And Shine, I'll, I'm gonna ask you if you have anything to add to that, but I'm gonna add one more question to, to you, um, sure. which is the last question we'll have. Um, okay. Were any types of content more effective in gaining engagement? Mm -hmm. So for example, photos, videos, posts, etc. what tactics proved most effective? Okay, sure. Um, for the first uh, question regarding breadth and depth, I think uh, what we can look at here is because we, when we did the campaign evaluations, the team for social media listening divided it into a more like a advertisement type of framework. So we had an awareness stage, an interest stage, and um, an action stage. And the, dis uh, the distribution of content across those stages were actually disproportional across all the campaigns. Some, sometimes the data would be skewed towards the end. There were more investment towards the end. Sometimes there were more investment towards um, the middle or the beginning. Um, so what the team came up with would be, especially the, the SML team, is to front load the media engagement, invest well on awareness stage in the hopes that we get to build um, an audience base that would be interested to move on to the next and keep engaging in the next um, stages of the campaign, whether it be it, it's going to be an event or it's going to be, you know, um, membership of sorts in a certain group, you know, we build an audience base straight from the beginning, which leads me to my next point. Um, this is actually an entire section in our recommendations, which is monitoring and evaluation. So apart from um, strategizing how to um, invest in terms of building the campaign and implementing the campaign, there needs to be, it's imperative that there is a monitoring system first, especially if the campaign runs in like a long period of time, months or even years, because um, our study, I think rolled from, uh, or study data from 2020, 2020 to 2022. So there needs to be a stable monitoring system for the, for the campaigns, which materials perform well, which don't, uh, which content types perform well and which don't. And, um, next, there needs to be, again, as I've mentioned earlier, an evaluation um, instrument for the campaigns. How do we actually know um, if we've changed people's minds? So we, we have to 
um, also establish instruments for that. And for live events, that's our top of mind um, answer, really evaluate what people think afterwards, after attending the event. Now, as for the next question, which is content type, um, visuals. Uh, from our from our study from the campaign evaluations, photos work so well, or they were they're the ones that would get to be disseminated a lot. They would uh, have higher uh, engagement than others, and not just photos. Actually, we also have this insight where real life stories work so well for people. When it's some, for example, in the advocacy about. Um, women owning startups or women in business. When it's a story about a woman who made it, the, the comments just pour out, no? you know? And it really inspires people to engage in the conversation. So I think, yeah, visuals and real life stories would work best or well enough, you know, up in terms of, in relation to other content types. Fantastic. Thank you, Shine. And I think it's, what's coming out so much is this importance of positive messaging too. I think all three of you have mentioned that. So just want to highlight that. So before we uh, hand over to Zermina for the sort of summary reflections and close, I just wanted to give each of you perhaps 30 seconds to a minute if you wanted to share any sort of final thoughts or reflections that you had based on our conversation today. Um, I'll start with Trang, if that's okay, then I'll go to Rija and finally to Shine. So Trang, over to you. Yeah, thanks a lot. So in summary, I think that gender norms is something culturally and unconsciously. So it is not easy to transform the norms in a very short time because transforming the norms need to be done gradually from like caregiver norms and breadwinner norms, which is very popular these days, to more leadership norms and things related to business. So um, as the, like, the practitioners, we may consider to create opportunities for supporters and resistance to develop the common crowds and conversation to that, so that they can understand each other. Similarly, we, can, we should engage more men in our gender equality strategies and promote the dialogues among intergenerational because this is where different generations have some different ideas about what should we do, what, how could we maintain the culture at the same time, promote for gender equality. Hey, thanks so much, Trang. Uh, Dr. Weijia, over to you. Yeah, uh, I guess um, what I learned is surprisingly, uh, there's a similar finding here. Yeah? among countries, uh, you know, trying to uh, talk about the lack of male uh, participation. That will be one of the things that, that we should address as well for the next campaign. Uh, and we can use, for instance, uh, male as influencers uh, as the model for that. Uh, but overall, what also interesting is that uh, there are more and more younger generation now, uh, the, urban millennials who are embracing the new norms and let go the old norms. And that's what we found. Even though, of course, um, uh, there are some part of the society who, who still embrace the old values. Uh, uh, and to, to witness uh, that it's going on and happening right now, I guess it's the blessing of uh, conducting this research and to, to be able to find uh, the, the findings. And, uh, but, but the campaign uh, surely has some limitations. So uh, the, the advice for the future is that, you know, besides uh, addressing uh, male, also not focusing or centering just uh, in, in the big cities. Maybe we, we should go more to the, uh, also uh, other areas of the country in Indonesia. Uh, and also that um, the platform. So now it's about the platform. Uh, it's interesting that uh, Instagram, we found that the this is the most effective uh, platform for creating conversation, but uh, we should not neglect other platforms as well. So if we want to be very effective, then we should use all the platforms because all the platforms have its own strength. For instance, Facebook is the most used uh, platform in the country, uh, unlike Instagram. And maybe we should uh, next time we use uh, TikTok as well. And the last thing is that uh, the role of influencers. Influencers is uh, very important uh, in Indonesia, 
to uh, to generate and to influence uh, the campaign for the new values, uh, including the religious leaders, um, and that would be should should be uh, noted and included as well. So uh, that would be some of the points from Indonesia. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Ija. Shine over to you. Thanks. So three things, circumstance, platform, and actor. So first, circumstance, um, we have to take into account contexts in which people live and, you know, in which people are operating. I think one insight that um, I wasn't able to share earlier, but might be interesting for, for everyone here also. In the Philippine data, we found that women engage in economic um, activities. Sometimes it's not the ideal or like all the sparkly concept of, oh, I'm going to go here because it's male dominated. I'm going to make a change. Sometimes it's not that. Sometimes women work because their husbands lost their jobs or women work because they just become single mothers. So we have to also take that into account as well. That's why um, I'm circling back here to my points earlier on having structures that accommodate women's needs, people's needs in general, um, in relation to um, family life and professional life, because it applies to both genders as well. Um, next would be platforms. I would like to take off from um, our colleagues here, our co-panelists here, in how different platforms will cater to different um, audience segments. And in thinking about that, I think one of the questions raised also in the Q&A was, um, how about people who are not on social media? So social media is a good platform, is a good tool, but it's uh, imperative also for us to reflect who are we capturing here and who are we not capturing here and how do we reach people who we do not, we are not able to talk about within social media. So that's uh, the next one. And the last one would be actors. Um, when we say involving people, we can think about it in involving people across levels from communities, individuals to institutional, you know, who should be leading the conversations, who should be, you know, um, create, how can we create networks across organizations um, in terms of forwarding all these advocacies, bottom up, top down, whatever have you, but yeah, across levels in general. So that's all for me. Brilliant. Thanks so much to all three of you there. Um, finally, I just want to hand over to Zermina now to summarize our discussion and to give her thoughts on, on where we go from here. Zermina, thanks. Over to you. Thanks, Atif, and thank you to our panel for that really engaging discussion on the research findings. And I want to also say many thanks to everybody for joining us um, today. It's great to see the interest and have you participate in the conversation. Some really great questions there. So um, Investing in Women commissioned this research because we do recognize this is an evolving area that we're working in, and we want to contribute to the learning and knowledge building around it. We do need to increase our understanding. There's a lot of potential with social, social media campaigns, but as you've heard today, there's still a lot that we don't know and need to dig a bit deeper into to see how these campaigns can affect positive change around the norms that limit women's economic participation. I picked up on a few common themes that were coming out tonight, so I'll just touch on them really briefly as part of the recap, being mindful of time. One thing that comes across a lot is, and we see it in our work every day, my team and myself, is that gender equality can come across as a really abstract concept. And depending how it's framed, it may not be relatable in diverse cultural contexts. It can also even be viewed sometimes as externally imported, controversial, et cetera. So when we work around norms, this is a consideration. That's come out, I think, from, from the findings from all three of the, the, the researchers. So, you know, using local voices and making sure that they share personal stories and create content that resonates with target audiences is proving to be far more effective. It's also dealing to a degree from what I've heard tonight, but also again, because obviously we're managing this program. It can deal with things like bringing men into the conversation more, you know, creating neutral spaces, not talking at men, but bringing men in so that we can work together with them around the you know shifting gender norms. And it can deal a bit with the backlash issue as well. So um, that I think was one really sort of running theme I heard today. And also I saw interest from our participants on it in the chat. The other one, of course, and it's one that we, we're challenged with too, 
is how do you measure the change? Yes, we have fantastic reach numbers and we all know what you see matters. So getting that much information, disseminating that out, highlighting and showcasing those positive examples of deviance from sort of the traditional views on the norms that affect women's work, all that is really important, but how do we convert that? I think that was perhaps Shine's language or how do we translate that into harder evidence of change. I mean, I use the word harder a little bit, you know, with them um, reluctantly, but it is the reality because we want to understand it better. So then we know how to adopt the, the most effective approaches. So we do recognize that that is um, something that needs to be looked at further and appreciate that it came out quite strongly in the conversation today. So I'd say those were the two of the main themes that I heard and just to, highlight investing in women will be going into starting its new phase fairly soon and we are intending on building further on this research there's several areas that were highlighted for further study and we're really keen on exploring those further and like with all our research our reports will be available on our website when they're finalized so i do encourage you all to visit them they are accessible and of course in addition we have other the interesting reports there that um, you may wish to read. Uh, just a heads up that we do have a report coming up and it's a recent review of, we do a, a survey that we conduct across all three countries with urban millennials. And we've been doing it for three years and it's a really great snapshot of what norms, uh, you know, what the changes around norms are around those three countries. So. That is another piece which may be of interest to you. And um, just in general, of course, we'd be very, we're always on the lookout for work that's being done in this space. So if any of you have any learning, we want to learn from you. And I encourage you to please explore this area further too. I can see you all are interested and there's a lot of experience in this room. So please, uh, you know, do share your findings with us and make them accessible. And I hope we can continue to work further on this. And that's about it from me. I do want to once again, thank everybody for joining before we close the webinar. And of course, special mention to ODI for co-hosting this webinar with us at ODI Align and to Artif for your moderation. We really appreciate it. Thank you all.